Thank you very much, Marin. Uh, good morning. It's great to see so many people here for the start of day three. Um, and a particular well done to all the faces I recognise from the late night photos on Twitter. So, um, it's my privilege uh, to be introducing Ollie Bray as the keynote speaker for day three, final day of the Alt Conference 2019. Ollie is the Global Director of Connecting Play and Education at the Lego Foundation. He is an educator with over 20 years' experience as an award-winning teacher, a transformative head teacher at King Lucy High School, uh, and also an educator who has advised um, government and the public sector on use of technology in learning and teaching. Perhaps just as importantly, given where we are, um, Ollie's also an alumni of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he did his postgraduate, uh, uh, sorry, his, yeah, his first postgraduate uh, in the University of Edinburgh to become a geography teacher, and then a postgraduate in educational leadership and management. Um, I was really pleased to hear that I'd be introducing Ollie because I had the privilege of hearing him speak um, quite a few years ago now when he came to do the keynote um, uh, address for a learning and teaching conference at my previous university. And Ollie did um, uh, a very energetic, very enthusiastic, uh, invigorating address about what was happening in the school sector with technology and what the implications of that would be for further and higher education, particularly students transitioned in. And that resonates very strongly with uh, our themes for this year, particularly around creativity across the curriculum uh, and learning from each other across the, the various parts of the, the, of the education sector. Um, I think within schools, within further education, within higher education, community education, we can go far and we're going far in our digital education practice, um, but we can go further if we work collectively. Um, and and uh, at the kind of um, heart of some of our themes for this year, is this notion of digital education as a joint project, a joint initiative we can take forward together. So, in the spirit of learning from one another across the various parts of the sector, please give it up for Ollie Bray. I'm just going to quickly zip the slides around. Hey, it's really great, great to be here this morning. Um, I was, I was going to start my, my talk by sitting on the front of the stage, but that's because my legs are tired and I had a lot of whiskey last night. I'm joking. Um, so, um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, it's always great to be um, in Edinburgh. Before, um, before moving to Denmark, and more about that in a minute, I, I spent the first 20 years of my professional career um, working, in, working in Scotland, and some of that's been mentioned already, but I did kind of want to give you a little bit of a, a sense of background because I think that that is, in, in, is important. So, um, as Keith mentioned, I, I did my teacher training in Edinburgh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Plymouth on the south coast. Uh, I moved to Scotland, um, horrified my mother because I'm originally from Dorset, but I was going to move 600, 700 miles away, um, but worked originally for Sports Scotland and then uh, trained to be a geography teacher. Uh, my first schools were in Edinburgh as a, as a student, but then I worked the first part of my career in, in East Lothian. If you don't know Scottish geography, it's the neighbouring local authority to, uh, to, to Edinburgh, um, but lived in Edinburgh for, for seven great years of, of my life. Um, if you know a little bit about Scottish education, you know that, that we had a, a big education reform a number of years ago. Many would argue that that reform is still ongoing at the moment in terms of lots of different ways, um, and I was quite involved in that at the start in an organisation what was called Learning and Teaching Scotland that then became Education Scotland, uh, the National Agency for Curriculum um, Design and, and now also Improvement. Um, and at part of that time, I did a piece of work for the Scottish Government around their first uh, Technologies for Learning, le learning Strategy. Um, and more recently than that, I mean, that, that to me seems like a, a million years ago now, and as I was wandering the streets of Edinburgh last night, I was thinking, my gosh, that seems, that seems like a past life that I was here, you know, first of all as a student and then working in Victoria Quay down in, down in government. But, but I guess kind of more recently, um, you know, over the last seven years, really, um, I took a head teacher job at Canusi High School up in the Scottish Highlands, where developing a, a digital culture was a big part of my, of, of my mantra and my mission in terms of transforming the school. Um, I was very, very involved for, for a period of years with Inverness College at the University of Highland, Highlands Islands. I'm very passionate about 
further education, and I'm very passionate about um, trying to make better links between further education and secondary schooling in terms of that holistic journey, um, all the way from, from three to 18 and beyond. Um, and until I moved to Denmark, I was very, very involved, and I have been very involved for a number of years um, with BBC Scotland around their Education Advisory Committee. So a bit of a, a long preamble into the different uh, sort of sectors I, I guess I've worked on and, and hopefully bring some of that insight to, to the conference this morning. Um, but, but it was time for a change and, um, and I had a, an opportunity uh, last November to, to sort of relocate and we relocated and uh, we moved to Denmark, we moved to Billund, it's not Copenhagen. Uh, this is the Lego house, it actually exists. It's about 250 metres um, from, from where I live um, in, my, in my apartment at the moment. Um, this is not the venue for the old conference uh, 2020. Uh, however, we do run conferences uh, from there, in particular the LEGO, the Lego Idea Conference. But, um, but I went and I joined the, the LEGO Foundation. And I'll talk a little bit more about the LEGO Foundation um, in a minute and some of the work that we do, because I think that that is, that that is, that is useful. Um, if you've got a great new idea for a new LEGO set, I am not the person to speak to. All right, I do not do that. If you're looking to get a discount right, on the Star Wars announcement and the new LEGO set Star Wars announcement that comes out today, I'm not the person to speak to uh, about that. Uh, I don't work for LEGO Education. I think I've got all of my disclaimers now um, out of the way. Um, but we will talk a little bit about some of the work that we do in, in the LEGO Foundation because I do think it is, um, it is relevant. And as I was sort of preparing for this talk, I was looking through the conference themes, um, and I got some advice from uh, some of the chairs of the conference, and I said, what, what is it you really want me to talk about? And they said, well, you're doing the keynote on the last day, you can pretty much talk about what you want, you know, you've got autonomy there. Um, so I thought I would start off with the fact that I, I really like cycling. I really like cycling. Um, and if anybody um, is uh, ever looking for someone to go cycling with, I am your person to do that. Um, but the, the main reason I mention this is it's a nice introduction, I think, to, to something I've tried to do all of my career. Um, and that is, um, when I think back to when I learned to, to ride a bike, um, this is the sort of bike that I had. It wasn't quite as cool as this. It was a second-hand striker that my mum bought from a charity shop. But this is the, the type of bike that I, I would have wanted. Um, and the interesting thing about, like, when, when I was younger and I was learning to ride a bike... Um, is that bikes came with these things here, stabilizers or training wheels or whatever you want to call them. Um, there was an interesting interrelationship, I think, between stabilizers and training wheels and elastoplast. Um, and the interesting thing about that, of course, was that when you rode a bike with stabilizers on, it was nothing like riding a bike. Because the hardest thing about riding a bike, of course, is the balance, isn't it? The easiest part about riding a bike is moving your legs around, because we're pretty good at that as we walk. You know, it's just, just changing the angle slightly. The hardest part about riding a bike is the balance. And it's been quite eye-opening for me, um, you know, moving to Denmark, because, you know, in, in Denmark, all of the children learn to ride bikes on these things. And increasingly within the UK, you know, we see more and more young children learning to ride balance bikes on, this, on the, these things, where they actually kind of get the balance bit first. And once they've got the balance bit, then they progress onto a bigger bike with pedals. Or if you've not got very much money or if you're clever about it, you buy a bike with pedals to start with and take the pedals off, right? and the kids balance, and then you put the pedals on, right? and eventually you get the balance, and then you do the kind of easy bit after that. And you're probably, um, probably wondering what the point of this is, and, and the point of it is, is that what I've tried to do, I think, during my career, um, is that I've always tried to think about things that, that work well. There's no doubt about it. Millions and millions of children around the world have been taught to ride bikes by using stabilizers. They've just had that torturous time when we've taken the stabilizers off to get to that next part. Yet, there's lots of research now and lots of evidence that we can teach children to ride bikes in better ways, um, within the norm of still riding to, 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 ride, to ride a bike. Um, so my point really, I, I guess, is that, and the, and the premise of this talk is around, um, how do we operate within boundaries, within sort of cultural boundaries, within schools, within the system, but how can we do things a little bit differently right, in order to improve things? Um, and one of my favorite quotes that, um, that I often use in conferences is a, a quote from the superintendent of schools, Chris Kennedy, um, and he's superintendent in the Vancouver schools. Um, and I just think that this is like, really, really useful, and I've used this a lot both at conferences but also working with teachers and school leaders, is this whole idea of that technology is not going to make teaching easier, but it is going to make it different. Um, and, and in fact... You know, if we're really passionate educators, you know, we know that education is like a really complicated, really, really hard job. And that's actually one of the reasons that we love it. 
Right, we might hate it, like towards the end of term, and that idea, but one of the reasons that we're in this is because it's complicated. And if it wasn't complicated, we would have figured it out already. So for me, it's about the, the, the difference, you know, and, and, how, and how we can think about making things different. Um, and that kind of links quite nicely, I guess, into what we do at the, you know, at the LEGO Foundation, because if we look at the LEGO Foundation's aims, the LEGO Foundation's aims are to redefine play, um, because a lot of people think that play is just for very, very small children, or that play is just about fun, right? and, it, and it's not about that, and we'll maybe get into some of that later on, but a highly complex thing, and we know that it's really, really important to try and be playful you know, throughout our lives, um, but also this idea of, of reimagining learning. And, and I was really, really taken to these two aims from the LEGO Foundation, because, of course, really, these are about doing things differently. The reimagining um, and you're redefining about doing things differently. And I was really super excited in particular, you know, of this one here about how do we reimagine learning into what it could be, but still working within, um, you know, the, the, the boundaries of the, of the system, um, if, if you like. So, um, so I, I thought I, I would just kind of, I'm not going to talk lots and lots about play during this talk, although we'll, you know, we'll link back into it. But, um, but I was uh, looking at this report just recently, which is a, a, a white paper that's been produced by the Lego Foundation. And, I, and I'll share the slides and I'll share all of the links um, you know, with you in the talk. And, uh, and I was quite interested in this as I was listening to some of the presentations yesterday when we were talking about online learning, we were talking about MOOCs, and you know, we were talking about, um, you know, talking about spectrums of online practice, if you like. And I was thinking, well, it's really, really interesting because there's, there's something about spectrums of online practice which actually are also very, very similar to spectrums of play. Um, you know, where we've got kind of like free play at one end where it's completely the child's choice. I guess you could just you know, think about that in terms of just like stuff that's on the internet that people kind of find and they kind of learn from. You know, all the way, all the way through to the other end of the continuum where we're talking about like real structure and real instruction, that kind of didactic approach to using technology. Um, yeah, for me, um, and in the Lego Foundation, we think the most powerful part is where you get the balance, you know, between that child agency you know, and that intervention from the adult to really make the kind of learning happen. And the messages that I was getting, certainly, from the presentations that I was attending to yesterday is that actually, in terms of online environments, online learning environments, again, you know, you want that, that, that notion of, of learner agency in there, but also they need, there needs to be some sort of structure, there needs to be some kind of guiding, there needs to be some kind of coaching that goes on with there as well. So it really got me interesting uh, thinking about the parallels between this. Um, another interesting link between play and technology is as we've been working at the International School of Billund, for example, and thinking about our work about learning through play in schools, particularly in the formal school setting, um, we've drawn on a, a lot of the research and a lot of the learning from um, technology-rich environments uh, and some of the learning that comes from that to really get the parent body on board around things because it's thinking about things in a different way, and I think that there are some interesting parallels in the literature around that. So that's a, a useful aside, which, um, which maybe, maybe links to you and resonates with you. So let's just talk a little bit about the, the LEGO Foundation um, and how that works, um, because I think that is useful, and it maybe will save questions later. So um, this is LEGO, and you know, underneath LEGO, we've got various different LEGO brands. For example, LEGO Education, the LEGO House, I showed you that nice picture of that earlier, the, um, the brands that are associated with LEGO Lands um, and the LEGO Land Discovery Centers. We've got the LEGO Store online and the retail stores as part of it. Um, and you may or may not know, but Lego is still owned by, by a family, a Danish family, um, you know, a very, uh, a very well-off Danish family, um, but, but also uh, like a really passionate uh, Danish family, the Kurt Christian family, that are really, really uh, keen uh, in terms of doing social good in the, in the world um, and are absolutely passionate about children, both in Denmark but globally as well. Um, so the Lego group itself, all of that kind of Lego stuff in there, is owned by two people. It's owned by Kirkby, which is the family's holding company. They own 75% of the Lego group. Um, and then the Lego Foundation owns 25% of the Lego group. And the mission of the Lego Foundation, I've mentioned already, is to redefine play and to reimagine learning. And what happens with that is that 25% of the profits that would come from the Lego group would come to us for philanthropic uh, use around that. Now, that's pretty huge if you think about it. You know, you sometimes see announcements from big companies that they will donate 1% of their profits for philanthropic goods. Um, so in, in terms of a, a corporation around this, um, it, it, it's a, a really big investment from the Kirk Christian family to try and do sort of social good around, around the world. And in terms of what I do there is um, I work on the, uh, the Collecting Play and Global Education program. And I guess the bits that would be relevant to this conference is the, the, the partnerships that I manage at the moment. One is to do with the International School of Billund, which is an international school in, in Denmark. 
One is the work that we do with the MIT Media Lab, which is particularly around the lifelong kindergarten and the personal robotics group. Um, so if you, and many of you will be familiar with the Scratch programming language, it's our, it's our ongoing work with, with Scratch and how we do that with Professor Mitch Resnick uh, and Cynthia Brazil um, in parallel and personal robotics. And also our work on what we call the pedagogy of play um, with Harvard Graduate School of Education um, and how we link that into schools and develop resources. So working with two university partners um, and, and the schools. And some of the things that we're, that we're thinking about, and again, I thought that this might be useful for this conference, when we think about our pedagogy of play work, is we're doing a lot of thinking around at the moment, um, what are the paradoxes? You know, the paradoxes between um, play, in, play in schools, or, the para and, and, or play and schools within the formal, within the formal system. Um, and um, again, you know, I think this is quite useful, you know, because I think that we could learn a lot from, from this and its contribution to the, to, the, to the field in terms of technology and technology integration as well. But there's some nice things in there. So play is timeless, but school is timetabled. So how do you get more playful schools? How do you, how do you exist within the system? Plays can be pretty chaotic, but school tends to be orderly. How can we get more playfulness into the system? How do we, um, you know, work around the edges around that? Play can sometimes be risky, but schools need to be safe. So how do we get more risk and that kind of risk-taking culture in there? How do we make that work? Play tends to be child-led, school tends to be adult-led. How do we get those kind of sweet spots, you know, in the middle with that graph that I was talking a little bit about earlier? So that's some of the things that we were doing. Um, and as I was sort of talking yesterday about some of the things I might talk about, somebody did say to me, yes, well, it is a technology conference, Ollie, so you should probably talk a little bit about technology as well um, in, terms of what you're, in terms of what you're doing there. So, um, so I thought I would make a statement about technology. So I do think technology is important, first of all. Um, and uh, it's obviously important for, for lots, and lots, of, lots and lots of reasons. Um, and these reasons uh, are reasons that I don't need to talk to you guys about because um, you work obviously, you know, extensively, you know, in this field, you know, at, di at, dif at different areas. Um, and we know obviously and we're very aware of all of these huge technology drivers that are going to impact on young people, that are going to impact on our, you know, on our, on our, on our universities. But there, are, but there are kind of other things that I think that we need to think about here in terms of how we position some of these large technology drivers, particularly in education, particularly in school education. Um, so <clears throat> we're doing a bit of thinking around this at the moment. So there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of rhetoric around AI in education. You've probably heard a lot about that. Um, I'm like really, really pleased to be in an audience where probably many people in this room could actually tell me what AI is and machine learning is, and it's not just being used to sell a product or a service, which is what tends to happen quite, quite a lot. Um, and there's lots of people that are obviously out there saying that AI will solve education. Um, and of course, uh, well, as a lot of people are, are talking about these things, is what they mean is that we can actually use AI to generate really, really successful rote learning practices that we've had for the last 100 years. You know, it's not really thinking about how we can redefine and how we, how we can transform learning. Um, and, and I mention it because I think, you know, I think that we need to, in terms of education, really get away from this term AI and education, and we need to play with the narrative a little bit more. Um, you know, because for me, it's really about what is education like in the era of AI, and I think that that links in quite nicely to some of the themes from, from yesterday morning's keynote, which is really talking about the ethics of AI around that. And we're not doing enough at the moment with working with young people around the ethics of AI, the ethics of data, in terms of how that, how that works. And we've got some interesting work at the moment um, with the Media Lab, which is, which is looking at that. Um, but it's not just the narrative when we're thinking about, obviously, uh, technology in schools or colleges or universities. There's lots and lots of challenges out there, whether that is time, whether that's children, young people, families, adult learners, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's driving results whether it's a research output that needs to be produced. You know, it is kind of, you know, hugely challenging times. And, and the more I've, I've thought about this and the more I've listened, you know, over the last two days is that if we really want to solve some of these problems, you know, for me it comes down to this whole idea of people, the people that make this happen, the pedagogy behind it, but also the leadership. Um, and, and I think that that word leadership has been available at this conference for the last two days, but maybe not in the sense that we really need it, need it, need it in. Um, we're all technology leaders in this field, and we all you know, play our certain part in the system. But one of the interesting things that, that seemed to be coming out of the morning keynote yesterday over, over coffee and over lunchtime is that we might be technology leaders, but we're not always the technology decision makers you know, in our institutes in terms of making that work. So how do we really you know, help the decision makers also be technology leaders? That's a really important question I think that we need to, need to go over. 
And I'm going to give you an example about this, and I think it's a bit of a controversial example, but you know, we do need to be you know, very, very careful when we talk about devices in schools, for example, where sometimes the, the purchasing of a large amount of devices in schools is made by one person or two people, yet the people that they're buying these devices from exist within a framework, and the people that sell those devices in that framework sell two or three or four different devices from different manufacturers. And one of the increasing challenges that I think that we see across the whole of the UK, in fact the whole of Western Europe, is that people are seduced into buying a device from a manufacturer that sells three different devices from three different manufacturers, and the device that that person ends up making a decision about is the one where the people get the most sales royalties on it. Because that's the truth. That is, that is the truth around some of these things. It's not because of the pedagogical reasons behind it a lot of the time. Right? It's because that this person can sell you three different devices. Some might be cheaper, some might be more appropriate, but they're really pushing the one because they know that they will take more sales royalties out of that. Right? And maybe I'm being a bit unfair there, but I do think that that is a real kind of ethical challenge that we have, and that's why we need you know, good technology leadership. Um, and maybe to sort of be a bit more lighted heart about it, it's then really thinking about you know, what are the appropriate tools that we, um, that we want to that we want to use. I always like Hope's, you know, example, um, you know, when she talks about the triple E free, free market, says, well, if you wanted to, like, put a picture on the wall, you know, then you'd probably use a hammer. Like, you could use a chainsaw, but it wouldn't be an appropriate tool to do it. Right? And I think it's quite a good example, you know, of, you know, of things. And we do need to be, you know, a little bit careful of some of these things. And we do need to be a little bit careful, of course, you know, that sometimes people increasingly, you know, are buying these new tools. Maybe they're a little bit shiny, but we're still using them to do the same things. You know, and online conferencing and meetings are great like, examples of that. So we do need to be taking a step back and we need to be thinking a little bit more about how are we making sure that we're making the right purchasing decisions for the children that we've got in front of us, for the context that we've got in front of us. Like I'm massively worried about cloud computing in East Africa, yeah, but these are the devices that are being sold in East Africa you know, at the moment a lot, a, lot, a lot of the time, but the infrastructure requirements aren't there. So we really need to think about you know, some of these things. Right? And we cannot get seduced into the nice and shiny things that are there just because they're nice and shiny and try and retrofit them into education. Right? We've really got to be thinking that. And that's why we need the strong leadership linked into the good teaching and linked into the good pedagogy. So moving sort of slightly sideways around some of these things, I guess it's important to reflect on what we're trying to do. Uh, I think we all know this, you know, we're you know, within education, without getting too philosophical about it or too in-depth about it, we're trying to make sure that, that young people have got a good balance, obviously, between the skills and knowledge. Both are important. People that argue that one is more important than the other don't really understand education, you know, a lot, a lot of the time in terms of making that, making that work. Um, I don't believe there's a, a difference between, you know, academic and vocational, right? It's in the middle. We've, we, we need to get beyond these arguments and we need to lose that historical, you know, rhetoric, I think, of the past. Um, but we do need to think about, you know, what are the skills that young people are going to need you know, for, the, for the future? And again, there's no shortage of national and international advice you know, and league tables which tell us you know, what skills may or may not be you know, appropriate you know, in, the, in, 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 the, in the past. But actually, if you look at all of these skills, they kind of all you know, say the same things. They're, they're, they're examples of, you know, of holistic skills. But the important point with all of this, of course, it's making sure that we firmly root the importance of these holistic skills within our context. And that needs to be within our local context, in terms of local employability and local social needs. And that needs to be within national context and then eventually international context as well. And so often, many of these skills frameworks are built the other way around. They're built within international context, and then only the local context is thought about at the last moment, which is why we don't get the buy-in from teachers and it doesn't ultimately um, go on to impact on the, on the young people. But I do suppose if we're thinking about you know, developing skills in these different ways, then, then I believe any way that you develop skills through um, engaging and immersive experiences. It's one of the reasons I've always been a massive fan um, you know, as, a, as, a, as a head teacher in, the, in, in outdoor learning. It's also one of the reasons why I've also been a huge advocate for, for digital technology and play-based approaches, because I do think that if we can combine the outdoors, digital technology, play-based approaches, we can create these kind of wonderful, engaging and immersive experiences. Um, you know, and slightly tongue-in-cheek that if we're really thinking about trying to create these kind of 
immersive experiences. It's not just being told about things. It's not just being told about stuff you know, all, all of the time. And we need to be careful not to create digital online learning environments which are just telling people stuff. Right? It needs to be two-way um, and it needs to be interactive. Um, and it probably would come as no surprise to you that one of the ways that I think that we can do this from a pedagogical point of view um, is that we can think about the characteristics of play. Um, within the LEGO Foundation, these are some of, the, some of our beliefs around the characteristics of play is that, is that a playful experience is something which is, which is meaningful, it's joyful. That word came across yesterday right at the start of the keynote. I love that, that whole notion of joy, the joy in learning, so, so important. Socially interactive, actively engaging, you know, and, and iterative, where young people can prototype and they can reinvent things. Um, and even though I'm using this in the context of playful learning experiences, you know, if I was uh, you know, in school or when I work with teachers at the International School of Billund, we often sort of say, well, these are the characteristics of playful experiences, but do you know what? These are also the characteristics of an excellent lesson. Now, you might not get all five of these things in your lesson at any one time, and there may be, you know, it may work as a bit of a continuum where you've got a little bit more of one thing and a little bit less of another thing. But actually, if you're working towards an excellent lesson, this gives you a pretty interesting kind of framework, framework to work towards. How are you making it e meaningful for the students? How are they walking away with that kind of joyful feeling of hard fun that goes with it? Um, how are they able to iterate on their learning to improve? Are they socially interactive? Are they, are they actively in engaged? Um, so <clears throat> let's just go back to, to, to Lego a second here um, and a bit of history. So Lego comes from two Danish words, which basically means, um, means play well. Um, and uh, here's a, another history lesson for you. This is the um, Kirk Christensen family. Um, so we've got um, all um, at the top there, uh, the, the founder of the company. We've got Godfrey in the middle, and we've got Kel at the bottom. Kel is now in his, his uh, early 70s. He's still actually involved um, in, in the company. There's a big event in Denmark tomorrow, which Kel is heading up um, for sort of Lego, Lego employees, which is why we need to sort of rush off, rush off tonight. Um, and the, the fourth generation is now very, very involved in the company, and the fifth generation, which are six girls, um, are also starting to get involved, and they range between the ages of seven and the age of, and the age of 14. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, you know, Lego started off not making plastic toys, but making wooden toys. Um, one of the, the best-selling wooden toys was this, was this duck. And, um, and what I thought we would do, um, just because I've been trying to emphasize the importance of play and that playful experience, those five characteristics, is, um, is I thought that we, would, uh, that we would have a go at a playful experience so that we can imagine what that's like. And this has got two purposes, really. One, I think it's important. Um, and secondly, it will give you something to play with for the rest of the talk if you don't like what I'm saying. So we're going to hand out some little bags to you now, and you're not to open your bag until I tell you to. This is the first exercise in what it feels like. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of rattling there. Okay, if you've, if you've got one, kind of hold it up and shake it in an, an annoying fashion. That's good, so we, can, so we can see who's not got one.
Okay. You got them? Just about there. Just about there at the back. Okay. Shake it towards someone. That's good. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to do. First of all, the health and safety briefing. In a minute, we're going to open these bags. Do not open it too enthusiastically unless the person next to you is wearing glasses. Right, try and control how this goes. Okay, so when I say go in a minute, I am going to give you 40 seconds. And in that 40 seconds, you are going to make a duck. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Ten seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, hold up your duck. Come and have a have a look at look at some of these. Some of these look quite interesting. Good. That's good. Yeah. Great, have a little look to the um, person to your left and your right. So, uh, loads, of, loads, of, loads, of good, uh, loads of good things here and an interesting activity. And I, and I suspect if we had a chance and we put all of our ducks on the stage, you know, we would end up with a picture you know, a little bit like this. All of, um, all, all of uh, the things that you've built are obviously a duck to you. Um, and many people, <laughs> many people would recognize them um, as, as a duck as well. But let's just have a, a little think about what, what happened around that. Um, Lots of things, uh, probably. So first of all, I mentioned already, there was probably was that whole kind of business of a bit of self-regulation at the start. I mean, you could see people, as soon as they got their bag, desperate to open it. They were sort of shaking that around, you know, around things, wanting to sort of try and make that work. Um, there was a bit of, uh, there was definitely a bit of symbolic representation. Now, I turned the slide off at the front of his, so you can, where's the picture? Where's the picture? How am I going to make a duck? It's not as if nobody's ever seen a duck before. All right, but again, Calling that out from the back of your head, you know, what does it look like to make a duck, sort of pulling that in. There was obviously some fine motor skills, some of you needed to improve your fine motor skills. I noticed that from the hitting of Lego bricks off this uh, wonderful historic floor that we've got here. Um, there was definitely a bit of, um, you know, visualisation that was going on. There was that kind of inner motivation when I said, right, you've got 10 seconds left here. You could see the speed and you could see the kind of pace really starting to move up. Again, there was more kind of self-regulation there, particularly as you looked around and you realised the person to your right stuck looked a lot like you look like duck than yours. And the person to your left stuck was still on the floor trying to pick it up. But again, you kind of pulled this together. Um, I would like to say that there was uh, you know, a little bit then of in terms of like ideation going on. Or, like, after you had a quick look around the room or look over your shoulder, you started to iterate on your duck to sort of try and make it better. In school, we call that cheating. In business, we call that collaboration, obviously. Um, you know, and at the end of it, when we said, right, stop there, there was that little bit of sort of self-assessment. Oh, yeah, my duck's definitely better than yours. Yeah, yours looks... <laughs> Yours looks like a deer. That looks like a deer, you know? Um, and then there was still that kind of like iteration and things that were going on. So there's like, there's like loads of stuff going on in here. Like we could, and we could actually sort of talk about this kind of like very sort of short process to try and encapsulate, you know, what we mean by kind of playful learning. But it's, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a short, you know, exercise to do it. And you can keep your ducks and keep your ducks and put that on your desk and take it apart and see if you can build it in different ways and just 
just remind yourself that sometimes that doing these little simple things can be incredibly playful in nature, and how do we pull these back into our, into, into our practice? Um, and when I think about, you know, when I think about what makes a good Lego duck, and when I think about, you know, what makes the activity good, and we've done lots of different times, is I always come back to, um, you know, what makes it kind of powerful. And I think, well, probably within the activity there, it was suitable for the size of the audience, right, in terms of, in terms of what, it, what, it, what it was. We could have done it with a bigger audience, we could have done it with a smaller audience as well. Um, and, you know, it involved hopefully some appropriate pedagogy. I wouldn't say the pedagogy was, was good necessarily, but some appropriate pedagogy. Um, but at the same time, the activity was interesting and engaging for the context that we were doing it, doing it in. If I'd have asked you to build a duck and that activity was going to take an, take an hour, that probably wouldn't have been, you know, appropriate. But for the context it was in, right, it seemed to work kind of, um, kind of, kind of quite well. And if I go back to then to my kind of like characteristics of, of, of play and I, and, I think, and I think through it, then, you know, it did have a lot of these things in it. Like there was, there was meaning for you, right, because you all know what a duck is in terms of, in terms of doing that. And it, was, and it was meaning because it was culturally set within the conference and the task that we were doing in it. I think it was joyful in nature. I don't know whether it was tears or laughter that I heard, but there were, you know, people seemed to kind of enjoy the task or the challenge of doing the task. It was socially interactive, Perhaps in socially interactive in different ways, sometimes in terms of dialogue, sometimes in terms of looking at other people, right, in terms of sharing all of these different things that we've had here, certainly actively engaging, and I'm pretty sure that there was nobody in the room that just put the six blocks together and said, I've made a duck. It was definitely iterative in nature, and indeed, you know, as you look around the room now, and this is, and you can continue to do this, there are still people that are being iterative in nature. There are still people that are working on their ducks, still trying to improve, improve these ducks. Um, and what I kind of wanted to do for the last like, little bit of the talk was maybe to, you know, to kind of unpack two of these characteristics uh, you know, a, little, a little bit more. We won't have time to, to unpack all of them. Um, but actually, what do we mean by, by some of these things? What do we mean by actively engaging? And I'm thinking about here, obviously, in the context of play. Um, and I guess the, the, the idea here would be to think about how can we then translate this to, um, to, to, to learning environments or online learning environments or classroom learning environments if you operate in there as well. Um, so we'll unpack actively in engaging, and then we'll also unpack iterative, because that will give us an interesting ta uh, an opportunity to talk about creativity. Right, then we'll sum up, and then there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. Does that sound all right as a plan? Yeah? And if that doesn't sound all right as a plan, you can try and build a reindeer, or you can try and build you know, a frog, or whatever, whatever you want with the Lego bricks that you've got in front of you. So uh, a couple of things, that I guess, around um, actively engaging pedagogies at the moment. One of the things that... Um, I wanted to kind of give a bit of a shout out for, and this is related to learning through play in schools, but we've just done a piece of research with the Australian Council of Education Research um, around this report, um, learning through play in schools, and what we've done is we've taken the five characteristics of play and we've tried to cross-match them to existing evidence-based practice. So which of, in, in terms of evidence-based practice, which of, which of the practices, the established practices out there that would tend to be more playful in nature? And this is the kind of you know, list of things that we've got here. Active learning, collaborative learning, cooperative learning, etc., etc. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the, the, the list. But the reason that I mention it and the reason I think it's relevant to this conference is because the next piece of research that we're going to be doing on here is we're going to be taking this report and we're going to be thinking about if we put a technology layer over that, how can technology, you know, contribute to these types of actively engaging teaching and learning pedagogies so that, we're, so that we're developing learning through play with technology, if that makes sense. Because there's, at the moment, there's, there's not a body of research that really pulls that together in one place. We've got isolated examples of it, but not a body of research that pulls that together in one place. The interesting thing for me, I think, about all of these um, types of practice here, to go back to my picture inside the Lego house that I used at the start of the slideshow, um, is that, for, for me, they, they link into one of the academics, famous academics that was mentioned in, the, in les, yesterday's keynote, um, which was Seymour Papert, you know, in the context of teaching Logo um, back in the 1960s, um, one of the early pioneers of, you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, and and Papert, you know, had this great kind of phrase that the best learning activities for students, and I guess he was really talking about offline, but I, but I think he was also, talk, he would now talk about online as well, and things would change, is there are activities that have got a low floor and they've got a high ceiling. So activities that are accessible to all, but different students at different places in their learning journey can climb those steps either quicker or slower than others right, in order to progress with their learning. And the whole concept of, of course, having the high ceiling is this whole idea about open-ended learning activity. So the learning just doesn't stop. 
Now, that's a real challenge for us, right, if we think about online education, because quite often, online education and formal education systems come to an end. We talk a lot about, uh, we talk a lot about yeah, lifelong learning, yeah, but actually, we don't, uh, we, we, and we talk about the skills that are, uh, that are there to develop lifelong learning, but quite often, actually, the courses come to an end, the year group within a school comes to the end, and everything is, has a bit of a kind of hard stop. So thinking about how are we not just giving the kids the skills, but how are we designing learning activities that have got this high ceiling in order for them to progress. Mitch Resnick, um, for, for, again from the, the Media Lab, um, who's one of the who, who interestingly now has got the title Leg Legate Papa Professor of Play or Professor of Learning Research, you know, added to this metaphor around the whole notion of we've got a low floor, we've got a high ceiling, but we also need wide walls. And that's about choice, and that's about personalization. And he does make a distinction between the difference between choice right, and also personalization. Um, because quite often we can give students a lot of choices, but that doesn't mean it's personalized to the learning, to the, to the, to the learner, thinking about that. And again, various other people you know, have, have iterated with this over the years around windows, ramps, and ladders. You know, and all of these terms you know, are linked to accessibility and how, and how we work. So I guess as we're thinking about designing these online, playful learning environments, you know, keeping this idea of low floors, high ceilings, wide walls in mind is a really, really important thing about what we do. Otherwise, we're really just reinventing the past, right, but in a digital way. Um, and then we've got kind of iterative, and we've done lots of iterative activities this morning. But iterative, you know, in terms of you know, how, do we, how do we try things out? So how do we imagine something? How do we then go and create something, just like we did this morning? How do we play with it to sort of get it work? How do we make it work, make it look a bit more like a duck? How do we kind of share our knowledge and feelings around that? How do we reflect on it? How do we reimagine it? How do we get on with it? There's kind of these big iterative loops that go round in circles and circles and circles. Um, and iteration gives us a great opportunity to talk a little bit about creativity. And that's what we'll just do for the last, you know, sort of few minutes of the, of the talk. So second part of audience participation, uh, who believes that children are more creative than adults? I don't, by the way, but I like to put my hand up to see if people will just copy me. So I don't. Now, you know, I might be wrong about that, but my personal belief is I don't, but I just like to put my hand up to see. All right? um, and you're probably thinking to yourself, well, children must be more creative than adults because I've seen this TED Talk, which has been viewed several million times. Right? And in this TED Talk, right, there's definitely a piece of research which is quoted in there from Head Start in the UK, which also references NASA by George Land, right, which suggests that when children are five years old, they're 98% creative, right, and when they're an adult, they're 2% creative. Now, obviously, you know, as, um, as, as academics, um, it's very easy to think about, well, actually, how on earth was this measured in the first place? Um, and, secondly, um, you know, and secondly, the interesting thing about this, and one of the researchers at the Lego Foundation, Dr. Elizabeth McCurr, she was tasked to kind of go out and try and find this research, and um, she, she is careful to use the term that the research doesn't exist, but what she will say is that she can find no evidence of it existing. And in fact, when she spoke to the people from, this isn't, this isn't um, Ken Robinson's fault, by the way, you know, he was probably informed you know, that, that it did exist, or he was using it, or it's quoted from somewhere else. Um, but when she spoke to the people from NASA about it, they described it as an urban myth. So it's interesting, you know, it's interesting around that. And I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying for a moment that, that, that young people aren't more creative. I, I don't believe that. And the reason that I don't believe that is partly because the body of evidence has also uh, has changed, but partly because I think we get confused in our words. And I'll give you an example about this, is that when I was younger, uh, I used to have a tree house. And I had great plans for this tree house. I wanted it, for example, to have um, a ladder going up to it, which it eventually did. But I also wanted it to have a pole that came down, electricity and a swimming pool. And not only are there some very obvious health and safety concerns, right, with my plan of, do, of doing this, um, but actually, you know, as a child, my mum might have said, oh, Ollie's really, really creative, but actually I wasn't that creative at all. What I, what I was, of course, is I had a good sense of imagination. And if we look at the research, like over the last decade in particular, what we do know now, of course, is that creativity, creativity is not the same as imagination. And sometimes we get those words confused, and sometimes we use those terms interchangeably. And of course, if we really want young people or if we really want students to be creative, again, it comes back to that term, how do you become creative in context? If we're going to produce creative products and creative services and creative solutions, it's got to be useful for someone. Right? It's got to be useful for someone. So what we know now, you know, what the research says now, is that really, you know, if we want to be creative, then we're going to, or if we want to in, encourage the creative process, 
you know, we need that kind of combination of originality, right, and we need appropriateness. We need it to converge, you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, and you know, there are lots of different examples of this, and we could spend time, you know, looking, looking, looking at this, but we need to sort of try and, you know, merge the two together. So, second question then. Um, children learn more flexibly, than ad- more flexibly than adults. Do you agree or disagree? I'm putting my hand up to agree. Of course, I could be lying now. What do we think? Yeah, so, so I, 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 I do agree with this one around this. There's lots, of, there's lots of evidence to suggest that this might be true. It's why the first 1,000 years of child development is really, really important, right? Because, of, because as young people are growing up, you know, they learn stuff incredibly quick, quickly. We had that lovely example yesterday with Instagram you know, at the front about how a young person is learning and soaking up that information straight, straight away. Um, but what's my point? Well, my point here is that if we really want young people or learners to be creative, then probably what we need is we need children and adults working together in co-creative teams. And by this, I don't just mean working together, I also mean learning together. So in terms of developing the skill of creativity, like within our our schools and within our classrooms and, and universities, the challenge here might be this question. So in your class or school, how often the children and adults learn together. Now, you can you know, replace that within your college or university. How often do learners and, 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 t- and teachers or lecturers learn, learn, learn together um, or work on something new? And my answer to this is that this probably doesn't happen a lot. I, I meet a lot of teachers and I meet a lot of lecturers and a lot of professors that say, I learn a lot from my students. But very rarely do they say, I learn a lot with my students. They might learn a lot from them, right, in terms of who they are, but actually learning with them, right, is something that we don't do very often. Yet, very, very important in terms of developing the creative process, it's really important that adults, you know, and children are learning together. So, what am I saying here? Just kind of want to, want to sum up this part, because I do think it's important. I'll just be careful what I say here to make sure I get my kind of wording right. So, I think it would be fair to say that children are not the creative geniuses, are not creative geniuses, but we've got a huge amount to learn from them. Um, and we must be, as adults or responsible adults, be really, really careful not to communicate that the highest form of learning is expertise. That said, adults are certainly not creative failures, and we should be careful not to shame one another for knowledge and expertise which is needed to bring these ideas into reality, which is the important part. And that leads us, of course, to the next question, which is around, well, how do we teach creativity? And again, coming back to Seymour Papert and all of the things he says is that we invite children to create new things. We invite children to build new things. And there's loads and loads of examples of this, and we do a lot of work around this. One of the examples that we do quite often is you know, just using these kind of like household objects, little electric motors. Um, Papert was obsessed with electric motors and, and vibrations. A lot of these ideas come from that, and pens and different workshops for adults and also for children as well. And the whole idea behind this is that you, is that you kind of build a unique machine and this, and this unique machine kind of creates this unique pattern. And there's something about that which is incredibly meaningful, you know, for the young person as part of it because they've been part of it. Um, and there's obviously no Lego that's involved in any of this here. Um, but there are, there are other things, you know, where we could use Lego or other bits and pieces. This is an activity called Sky Parade. I was working on this workshop down in South Africa with these South African teachers and we were, we were building and iterating and kind of making these, these cable cars that, that sort of come out from nowhere. And you can see the different designs that we've got here and that feeling of joy and excitement you know, on different people's faces as they came up and one catches up with the other. Um, And we've got one here which is not quite as successful, and a different one and a different design. But this idea of making things and kind of creating things. And then we do a lot of thinking, um, again, with our partners um, at MIT around kind of Scratch, visual programming language. You know, how do we take the concept of Lego blocks and put that into the, digi- into the digital realm? So making things, a lot of work around, well, it's not just about following instructions, but how can we actually get kids to you know, start with the basics? that kind of low floor, and then iterate on their own designs to solve new problems in terms of robotics, but actually really trying to get kids to create, to make. And I have this kind of massive concern at the moment that 
the, a lot of education products that come out of there are really all about solving puzzles rather than about kids working on projects. And there's nothing wrong with solving a puzzle, but I kind of think that the skills associated with solving one puzzle can kind of be transferred to the other. But solving a problem, a real problem, problems are different, and how do we get more of that you know, into our learning and our teaching? And the things that I've talked about there are obviously these kind of like robotics, making, tinkering, creative coding, pulling these things together. Um, but again, it's, for me, it's about working together and making things work in these kind of collective teams. And I'm just going to slip through these. I thought I deleted them, but I haven't. Um, so for me, um, the thing that kind of binds all of those activities together and playfulness and the use of technology is this word, is this word curious. And <clears throat> I'm passionate about this word. And the reason I'm passionate about this word is because I believe that if we can really develop curious people, then curious people tend to be playful in nature. And I think that we can really you know, use these to sort of try and tackle some of the problems that we've got. And I guess sort of my final remark would be is that as in terms of developing curious people, we also cannot forget that as educators, wherever we work within the system, very, very young children to older lifelong learners, that we can't forget that we're in the business of developing people or we're in the business of developing curious people. And my key kind of takeaways from the talk would really be around if we're really trying to develop people, we need to go back and we really need to understand what do these people need? What do, pe what do people need? What are we trying to do? Local context, national context, international context, not the other way around a lot of the time because need is very much a local and it's very much a personal thing. Then we need to understand, well, what are the skills, what are the skills that we need in order to help with this? You know, again, you know, we talk about creativity, but creativity can mean so many different things to different people depending on the local context. The creativity skills that you need in East Africa are very different to the creativity skills, for example, that you might need in Edinburgh. Yeah, so what is the actual skill? We need to unpack the skill. It can't just be these kind of hollow words. And then we need to understand how to develop the skill to suit the need. So the unpacking has got to be around the need, and it's got to be around the skill, and then we need to think about how we link both of the things together. And if we get that, and if we've got curious people, then I honestly believe, I honestly believe that we can move the whole system forward. And we can move the whole system forward by encouraging teachers and lecturers to think about looking inwards, looking outwards, and looking forwards, being curious all the time, developing practice, developing pedagogies, developing technology solutions, right, in order to meet these learner outcomes. So I've talked uh, a lot there. I've talked about some, uh, I've been a bit of a journey in terms of some of the work we've done in the Lego Foundation and, some of the, and how that links into play and how it links into technology. Um, and hopefully there might be some takeaways for some people to take away in terms of context. Certainly, hopefully, there's some things to think about. I personally don't think I've been talking about very much than, than this. And I like to use this slide, particularly in Edinburgh. It's also very useful in Denmark when it rains a lot. Um, because I don't think, I think a lot of what I've hopefully been talking about you know, over, over the last little while really has been an awful lot of common sense. But I think that sometimes in our jobs, we forget about the common sense because we get burdened with all of the other pressures that come in. And sometimes it's just a case of being able to step back right, and to think to ourselves, right, what are we actually trying to do in terms of developing people? What do people need? What are the skills they're going to need for the need? And how do two of these things come together? And how can we do that in a curious and hopefully playful way? So thanks very much. seems not to be working. Ollie, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a, a great uh, keynote and great start to day three. Uh, there's a lot of love for your keynote and a lot of enthusiasm for what you were saying, both on Twitter and in Bbox. Um, what I think I'll do is uh, we'll just go to the floor just now and yep. see if anyone has a first question. Uh, I've got Sheila down here. Thank you very much, Ollie. That was a great um, keynote and I'm so happy I have a duck. <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting about play, but um, as you were talking, what was going through my head was questions of power and power dynamics, and actually how people, quite a lot of people are scared of play. Mm -hmm. So how do you think we can start to um, make those cultural changes around people not being scared of play? And I was thinking particularly 
in more online environments when we're thinking more about individual things. And I think there's just a lack of play and curiosity mm -hmm. and creativity because we have these bigger things coming in. It's just like you go through tick, tick, tick. Yeah. Just wonder if you had any thoughts on that. <clears throat> so, I yeah, I, so I don't know if I've got the answer to that, but maybe two like statements which which might be useful. One, one, of, the, one of the things is that in in terms of education systems, you know, we're, you know we're, we're sat in a country at the moment that's possibly got the licence for the most playful education system in the world, other than New Zealand, you know, in many, in many ways. The, the licence to play within formal education within Scottish schools is incredibly, um, is incredibly powerful. Um, helped, you know, by, by the fact that the, 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 re, the quite recent announcement from uh, Nicola Sturgeon around the fact that the, of the willingness to enshrine the UN Convention of Human of child's rights into law, which includes the right to play, and of course the child is defined as from zero to 18, which is a really useful thing, thing, thing as well. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the other thing is, is that, you know, we, we spend a lot of time at the Lego Foundation, this is maybe a criticism of some of what we do, you know, working with, with countries that aren't as playful, you know, and we're trying to build up a bit of momentum at the moment for actually going out and working within countries and with the context where, where, the, where the system and the structures are in place to see whether we can meet in the middle somewhere. So I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but there's a, a commitment there to do things. The other thing I think about online environments is if we went back to that slide that I showed showing the continuum of play, and I was trying to link that into the continuum of online environments, is I think that at the moment, um, and I think we're seeing a change in this, but I think in, in a lot of online environments, people have been very, very obsessed with the term gamification, like over, like over, over time. Um, and although I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place for gamification, just like there's a time and a place for games within, within, within play, you know, play is more than that. So, it, so, so if we've kind of got that gamification bit right-ish, you know, in some online environments, how do we now work towards the other, the other the spectrums and the continuums to make that, make that work? So I'm not really sure I've answered your question, but I do think there's a place in terms of policy and linking policy together. And I do think there's a place in terms of, well, you know, we've already got a bit of this in online environments, but it's a narrow view of what play is. How do we now work around the edges to make that, make that better in a more open-ended way? Great, yeah. thank you. Um, Ollie, got, we have a number of questions on VBOX as well. I wonder if we can maybe take the, um, where is it? Yes, the middle one, um, which would be something that I think a number of us might be thinking about. Um, do you think our education systems format us in a way that make us not use our natural creativity? Yeah, I, do, I, 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 think, I, think, that's, I think that's true, because I, and, it, and it kind of maybe links into the first question before, is, I, is that I do, the more, the more and more I've thought about this, um, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, certainly over the last sort of five years, and the more and more I've read on it, and the more I've, I've become absorbed in it since joining the LEGO Foundation, is there's definitely something in, in that co-creation, you know, between, that, between, between the child you know, and, the, and the adult, coming together to make and to create, and to, and to create things. But quite often, I think, within schools um, and sometimes within further and higher education settings, there's that, there's that power dynamic. So it still is all about the knowledge transfer rather than about actually making new things and, and, make, and making that work. So, so from that point of view, I, I do think that the system can stifle creativity in terms of making that, make, making that work. Um, and I also think that, certainly within schools, is that there's not always the time and space for, people, for, for things to be creative. Because quite often, you know, if, you, if we think about the creative po uh, process, the creative process is always associated with a huge amount of failure. Whereas, you know, in, quite often in schools, failure is associated with, you know, with, with the wrong thing. We're, do, we're doing the wrong thing. Um, so, so we gear a lot of education in schools towards success, which translates to spoon feeding, which is not helpful for the creative, for the creative process. Um, and I think, I'm digressing slightly, I think we've got some major challenges ahead. You know, as, as, as PISA 2021 start to, to assess creative thinking, you know, as part, as part of their thing, it, we've got some major challenges ahead of what that might look like. Um, you know, can you actually assess creativity or creative thinking via a standardised test? Are we then standardising creativity? I mean, these are some big questions that we need to kind of really, really wrestle with, I think, in the next couple of years. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll go back to the floor. Are there any questions? Uh, one at the very back there. And if you could say who you are and where you're joining us from, that would be great. Uh, John Traxler from the University of Wolverhampton. I wonder when I listen to talks um, that infrastructure and resources um, and material issues are presented as barriers and wonder if, actually if you get beyond those 
um, what you reach are barriers in terms of culture. So in hearing what you're saying, I'm worrying about our words and concepts like innovation, risk-taking, play, and so on, problematic in some cultures inherently, even after you've removed any um, barriers in terms of m material um, assets. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and I think there are, I think there are, there are two points there. The, the first is, is that if we remove the challenges of resources, you know, when we, you know, when we, you know, there, there will be some institutions here that are very well resourced, right? We always want more, right? But there will be some institutions here that are very well resourced, and there will be some institutions that, that, that aren't. Um, but, but even when these institutions are very, very well re resourced, they're maybe not using that resource to really encourage collaboration between learners and teachers, teachers and teachers, in, in terms of improving, improving practice around that. So, so I, 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 I do think that we, that we need to work on both of these things in parallel, is I don't think that, that we should become too obsessed with the resourcing. We should always keep focusing on that culture first, because the resourcing actually, if you look at it historically, will always get there. But then when it gets there, if the culture's not there, you're actually not moving things, move, move, moving things forward. Thank you, John. Um, uh, we'll maybe take another question from VVox. I'm reading it out mainly uh, for the benefit of colleagues who might be watching online. Um, could we take Jilly's question, how does learning with the class mesh with having clear learning outcomes and a somewhat assessment-driven education structure? So, um, so, some of the, so some of the work that we've been doing around the, the pedagogy of play, as I say, um, has, has, been, has been designed to look at what the playful learning environments within the formal school setting. And by formal school setting, we mean settings where learning outcomes have to be met. Um, so everything that happens within the confines of the, the, confines of the, of, of, of the, of the system. Uh, so, so we think it's possible. Um, we've just done, we've done some work on the in this in an international school in Denmark. Uh, we've done some work on this in three very very different schools in the Johannesburg area, of South Africa. And next week we're kicking off the third stage of the research um, in three different schools in in Boston in the in, in the U.S. And I'll kind of I'm telling more of a story here than answering the question. And our idea behind that is that um, what we're trying to do is trying to kind of create a meta model of of um, what learning through play looks like within the formal setting and to give people the tools to be able to kind of recognize that because once you've got the tools to be able to recognize that within your cultural setting then you can start to think about how does that link into learning outcomes and how can it link into assessment around that around around that as well um, and I, I do i do agree around the the, the assessment question um, there's there's a, a massive amount of evidence uh, sorry there's a, there's a massive lack of evidence at the moment and a big gap in the field about learning through play and assessment. Um, all of the, nearly, nearly all of the research literature when we talk about play and assessment is, is very obsessed with like, game metrics, particularly in the, digi in the digital contracts, rather than looking at the spectrum of play, make, making that work. So I, I think that's a gap in the field at, at the moment. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Um, we're just about on time, so with apologies to colleagues that didn't have their questions addressed, um, I think the number of questions has probably testament to um, how engaged uh, people found the keynote. So thank you very much. Can we give a, a final thank you to Oli, please? Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.
Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.